Welcome to the Total Picture Podcast. I'm Peter Clayton. Today, we're going to focus on immigration, specifically the Diversity Immigrant Visa Program, also known as the Green Card Lottery. The Immigration Act of 1990 established the current and permanent diversity visa program. And joining me today is Brian Francher. He's the vice president of I-9 Product Management and chief compliance officer at Tracker, which was recently acquired by Mitratech. Brian, welcome to the Total Picture Podcast. Tell us a little bit about your background. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me on. Happy to join you today and talk about immigration. Um, you know, I got started in immigration right after completing my undergraduate degree. I was really interested in immigration law and immigration practices in the United States and was toying around with the idea of going to law school. And before that decision, I decided I'd go work for an immigration firm. Um, so I ended up doing some nonprofit work in immigration uh, and then later got into the for-profit immigration business for, for business immigration processes Decided not to go into law school, but ended up staying in that field um, and eventually uh, got involved in a law firm that had a proprietary immigration case management solution software. This was late 90s. Things were new in the technology space around immigration, and the firm I was working for was building their own platform. Um, I got involved in that, got really excited about immigration technology. Uh, and use that experience to pivot over to Tracker Corp. Uh, Tracker Corp uh, was a company recently acquired by Mitratech, as you mentioned, and Tracker had both the immigration case management platform, which is predominantly licensed by immigration attorneys or corporations that have large immigration teams. And Tracker also has the uh, a Form I-9 and E-Verify platform, which your audience I'm sure is familiar with the Form I-9, uh, those were our two primary products. Uh, and that immigration background, that experience that I had uh, in, in, in the business, uh, you know, facilitated that, that transition to the technology space. So is Tracker operating as a separate company or are you now integrated within, I guess you pronounce it Metrotech? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Tracker has been acquired by Metrotech and we are folded into and have integrated into the Metrotech organization. It is pronounced Mitratech. Uh, there's an interesting story there. Um, uh, but yes, so Tracker is, is a part of the Mitratech company and that portfolio. And now Mitratech, uh, the, the mission of Mitratech is for us to support our clients in their uh, businesses to provide greater visibility, predictability, and efficiency over risks and opportunities created by legal and regulatory environments. So Tracker with the I-9 platform and E-Verify platform and immigration platforms fits really well into that mission statement. Um, you know, businesses out there are particularly interested in I-9 compliance, immigration compliance, and that just fits really well with, with the Mitratech portfolio. So, you know, Mitratech was is able to assist our customers in the marketplace with overcoming uh, I-9 audits, which are on the rise, remote workforces, which as we all know, as a part of COVID and the nature of the, the change in which uh, workforces are becoming more diversified, more distributed, more remote, that I-9 requirement, which we can get into, the, the tracker products help overcome those challenges. So that's that's the fit and that's where we stand today. So it sounds like uh, Mitratech is a company that plays in the weeds and, and that's what it uh, basically does, right? Exactly the stuff that right. nobody really wants to deal with. That's a great observation. I think that's <laughs> true. You know, compliance isn't sexy. It doesn't, you know, um, it, it, it's, not a, it's not something that people strive for. But if you get it right, which is something that trackers had a proven tracker in MetroTech as well, um, it creates such tremendous value for our customers. Uh, yeah. yeah. Risk and mitigating risk is, is an important deal in our, in, in, our, in our business operations for sure. Yeah, I can't imagine when you were in high school, you thought, Man, I'm going to be an I-9 ninja when I grow up. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because, you know, at, at, at the holiday parties or par when we used to have face-to-face -face encounters and someone would ask me, what do you do? I'd say, well, I work in HR compliance, but it's a lot more interesting than that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> 
So let's talk a little bit about I-9. Um, okay. Specifically, what is it for the people in the audience who are not quite familiar with this whole immigration thing? Sure. So, I, you know, the Form I-9 is the Employment Eligibility Verification Form. And this is a, a form that all U.S. employers must complete for every new hire um, for in, those individuals that are working in the United States. Um, and the form, the purpose of the form, the whole purpose of the form is for the employer to do their due diligence in verifying that the person who is working for them is who they say they are, that's verifying someone's identity, and that that individual has employment authorization in the United States. That's the work authorization piece. So that's the I-9. Now, you know, so if you think about it, according to the Department of Labor, there's anywhere between 55 million and 58 million new hires or new people starting new jobs in the United States. So there should be that number of I-9s created annually by the employers in the United States who are employing these individuals. So it is a legal requirement that all employers complete a new I-9 for new hires. Um, basically, the, the thing to think about, which is interesting, is that the form I-9, that call letter I-9, the I is actually immigration. The I in I-9 is, an, is immigration. So this is an immigration form. It's managed by the government agency that oversees immigration benefits. Um, and what's odd, what might be odd about that is you think, well, most of the people that are working in the United States aren't immigrants, they're US citizens. There is a significant portion of our workforce that are foreign nationals or people here are on green cards, permanent residents. Those are obviously not citizens, but citizens and non-citizens alike must complete this immigration form. It is the only immigration form that U.S. citizens complete uh, for, 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 for these types of uh, processes. So it's an interesting fact there. Yeah, absolutely. So here we are in 2021, and we have a new administration, which uh -huh. has a very different outlook on immigration than the past administration had. So what are some of the new reforms to the employment-based immigration system that companies need to be aware of today, Brian? Sure. So there's a couple that are uh, carryovers from the previous immigration, uh, sorry, administration um, that are important. Um, mainly, and this gets a little into the weeds, Peter, but there's a visa classification known as the H-1B visa. You may have heard about this. This is a, a specialty occupation visa that's eligible to foreign workers who meet certain criteria for certain specialty occupations. Generally speaking, these are individuals who are going to be working for uh, an employer whose uh, job requires at least a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Um, the, the short of the story is that um, employment eligibility visas under the H-1B program are uh, managed by a quota. So there's a certain number of these H-1B visas that are available per year. And starting last year, the government changed the process through which employers register and file their H-1B visa petitions. In the past, prior to this change, um, the government would allot 65,000 H-1B visas for the bachelor's degree category. And there was a free for all. Uh, basically every employer who wanted to file an H-1B visa would compile, compile their petitions, file for this employment benefit for this foreign national worker that they wanna have come work for them. And it, you know, the likelihood of that petition being accepted would be dependent upon how many other employers filed for their H-1B visas. And there were years where um, there might be 100 or 200,000 H-1B petitions filed for 65,000 visas. And what right. happened is uh, you know, this influx of petitions would be filed. The government would have a process of selecting those, but selecting the, the winners. Um, um, and then they would send back the petitions to the employers for those that weren't selected. Um, so the government has said, hey, let's change this process and let's actually have the petitioners pre-file register for the H-1B visa program for that, that filing that they're going to complete. And we'll pre-select those individuals that uh, will be eligible to, to submit their petitions. Um, and that was a big change. That meant that employers now need to uh, register in a government website, um, 
as a registrant for this process and then wait for that selection process uh, to hopefully bear the good news that they would be eligible to file that petition. Uh, it did clean up the process in many ways, but also created some more complexity. That's an important step. Now, some people in your audience may not know what an H-1B visa, may never know, may never be a part of that process, but for companies that do participate in, in H-1B petition filings, this is a really big change. Well, I think most companies today do participate in H-1B mm -hmm. visas. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be called the Silicon Valley. Right. Right. <laughs> but, exactly. But everyone now are, are basically looking, especially in, in technology, in the technology field, are looking for, for the same people. Um, so let's get back to the diversity visa for just a sure. second, because um, if your native country, say India, is not eligible under the diversity visa, are there other ways you can qualify? Well, so for the diversity visa, if you're, um, it's a very interesting program, right? Enacted in 1990, um, the purpose of the diversity visa program was to, as it's the name implies, help diversify um, the population of individuals who were immigrating to the United States by assisting folks who, who uh, whose origins are from countries that are underrepresented in the uh, US population. So because there are so many uh, Indian nationals that are immigrating to the United States um, uh, through other visa programs, uh, those individuals uh, don't qualify for the diversity visa program because there's enough India diversity coming from India, at least that's the thinking of how the program works. But you know, there are some exceptions. Um, so if I were born in India, which is typically the way that the visa program, diversity visa program works. It looks at country of birth. Um, that is the first criteria that's used to determine eligibility. If I'm born in India, I don't qualify because India isn't, uh, India isn't a country that's underrepresented per this program. But if my parents were born in a different country and that other country is underrepresented and could qualify for a diversity visa, then I may be eligible to apply. Um, there's some nuance here, so it's always important to get your facts straight and follow the uh, instructions. They're very clearly described on the Department of State website. Uh, yeah, but this is, this is one potential workaround. There's also um, the, the idea, in addition to your parents, perhaps having a different country of birth than yourself, but also your spouse. So if I'm an Indian national, but I'm married to someone uh, you know, from Vietnam, well, Vietnam does qualify for the diversity visa. So I could um, a, be a beneficiary to my spouse's application as well. So uh, what are the uh, educational requirements for the diversity visa? Yeah, so the ed educational requirements, um, there, are, there are educational requirements for the diversity visa qualifications. One is that uh, either you have a, um, the equivalent of a high school diploma, or two years of working experience um, in, in the workforce that would, would demonstrate uh, your, 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 uh, your, your, your labor expertise, if you will. Um, so there are, the, the requirements are minimal, uh, but there are some educational requirements to be aware of. So what are some of the other issues that you're dealing with, Brian, with, uh, within 2021 regarding immigration compliance? You had mentioned a few earlier, but uh, is there anything else that our audience should be specifically aware of, especially our audience who are in the recruiting and HR space? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's a really interesting time. And I'll come back to the change in the administration. Um, as really a turning point, a potential turning point for our immigration laws and regulations. So, you know, every every change in administration, there always seem that the conversation starts over again, where we talk start talking about comprehensive immigration reform. Um, if we think about immigration reform, um, there's really been uh, we're long overdue. Um, the last meaningful Immigration Reform Act was passed under the Reagan administration in 1986. And interestingly, uh, it was that bill that uh, created the Form I-9 that we talked about earlier. Right. Prior to 86, there was, there was no such thing as a Form I-9. Um, there were still laws that prohibited employers from employing individuals who weren't work authorized, but there was no 
document that employers were required to verify that they're not breaking the law. Um, but so, so if you think about it, Peter, we, we have a very complex process of U.S. immigration, extremely complex. And um, there's been no meaningful, comprehensive change to this complex process in over 35 years. I mean, think about that. If you were running a business and you had a very complex process, but for 35 years, you decided not to revisit it, examine it, find out how you could improve it. You know, the times have changed. How do I need to adjust this process in order to meet the needs uh, that the process you know, for, for the organization that the process serves? I mean, really think about U.S. immigration um, as serving the United States best interest. So, uh, you know, I'm not going out on a limb. I think most people would agree comprehensive immigration reform is needed, but it's obviously extremely challenging to do politically. Right. Um, so with avoiding the political question, um, you know, how can we affect change? Um, and so the Biden administration came out with a comprehensive immigration reform bill. This happens almost with every new administration. It's a very comprehensive bill. It covers, you know, many different corners of the immigration space in terms of the uh, number of divisa, uh, diversity visa lotteries, uh, the program would be increased from 55,000 diversity visas to 80,000. That's one example. There are many other examples, too many to go through. It's a four, almost a 400 page bill. I don't have time to cover that. Well, but, that one is just significant. I mean, the yeah. increase, right? I mean, it's almost yeah. like double. Exactly right. Well, the, there's an analysis that came out yesterday um, that suggests that if this bill were to pass, and the, and the likelihood of the immigration bill passing in uh, in totality is very low, but if the bill were to pass, there'd be an increase of about 350,000 green cards or wow. uh, permanent, re permanent resident visas, as we say, uh, year over year. So that's a significant increase, of which there'd be a 25,000 increase in the diversity visa program. Uh, but, you know, it, it, is, it, it is comprehensive. Uh, so it is covering many different aspects of U.S. immigration. I think the thing to think about for your audience is that the Biden administration is likely to move forward with um, pieces of that bill uh, in, in a more transactional way. So, for example, today there is a vote on the House floor around the Dreamers Act um, in order to, um, you know, create a, a pathway for citizenship for the for dreamers and dreamers are um, certain individuals who were brought into the United States uh, without documentation by their parents, but uh, they were at a young age and had, you know, little to do to do with that decision and they've been here so long that they're not familiar or, or, or don't have any knowledge of their country of origin. Um, so returning them ha having those individuals be return to, to, to their home country doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, there's a vote going on today on, on that, on um, just specific regulations that pertain to dreamers. And right. interestingly enough, Peter, if I'll throw one more tidbit out there, it's more of a tease than something we can do a deep dive on. But last night, the Republicans came out with their counter proposal to Biden's bill. So this is fresh hot off the press news. Uh, Biden came out with a 350 page bill um, and the opposition party, the Republicans, have now come out with uh, an outline of their proposed bill. The bill hasn't been announced as a, or published as of the time that we're recording this, uh, but they, did have, they have put out a, a proposal. Uh, um, haven't had a time to do a deep dive on that analysis, but clearly we're seeing some movement politically um, for this, you know, to have this conversation. Um, ultimately, um, if the if there are certain aspects of the Biden bill or um, a counter proposal or negotiated compromise bill from from the, from Republicans, there will be changes this year that will be meaningful to to HR uh, recruiters. Uh, just the whole HR space will be impacted. Right, something and, to keep an eye out for. Yeah, and I think the Dreamers Act is certainly something that most people are very well aware of, mm -hmm. and it it seems like there is uh, some momentum behind that at this point to mm -hmm. actually you know, grant these folks who, as you mentioned, have been in the country so long that they really don't even know what their home country really was um, that and, you know, they're, they're all working. That's right. There was a study that was done by the Pew Research Center that showed that uh, it's like 97 percent of dreamers are employed. Um, right. That they had a they had a, uh, like a buying power, an annual buying power of eight billion dollars in terms of 
you know, how they're contributing to the economy. So very, you know, clearly integrated into the, into the United States in terms of its workforce and economy in very meaningful ways. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. You, know, you had, you had mentioned that the diversity visa program is a lottery. So yes. if you've applied, can you check your status? You can. It's one of those things where, you know, the government, as we know, is not apt at delivering software and technology solutions. So they're a little slow. <laughs> so what happens is you apply for the diversity uh, lottery um, in October. That's when the, the that's when the opportunity opens for applications. Right. And then that up and then that uh, window closes in November. And then you you hear back in April. Um Actually, I think it, it may be May. It depends. It, well, there's always a chance that they'll delay uh, notifications, but notifications are going to come four or five months later. You will be able to check online um, the status of your application for sure. Great. So, you know, I, I've heard that if you're selected for the green card lottery, it's important to act fast, even though it could yeah. still be, as you mentioned, more than a year before you're able to come to the United States. Is that true? It is true. Um, and the part of the reason for that, Peter, is that although there, the government only issues 55,000 green cards or legal permanent, uh, permanent resident visas, um, the lottery typically will over, well, will award maybe twice that many individuals the right to apply, knowing that if the visa lottery program only selected 55,000 individuals to apply for the visas that not all of those individuals would apply. So therefore you'd have these unused visas. So they overestimate the number of, uh, of, of winners. Um, so you wanna make sure that if you are selected for the program, you apply as quickly as possible because there is the, the quota will not change. So if 100,000 people are granted the uh, opportunity to apply and, as soon as 55,000 of those visas have been issued, if you if you apply too late, you may not be able to, to receive one of them. You know, I've also heard, Brian, that there are a number of deceptive agencies mm. that charge fees from applicants and falsely claim to increase the applicant's winning chances. Is that yeah. is that true? It is unfortunate and true. Uh, you know, in this day and age, um, you know, we really need to pay attention closely to the information that we're being told when it comes to immigration benefits. Um, there are a lot of bad actors out there um, that are trying to take advantage of a population that quite honestly feels vulnerable in many cases. Uh, you know, if you're not a US citizen and you wanna to come to the United States, you're really, you're eager to find out what advantages may be available to you and you might be susceptible to some of these fraudsters out there. So right. it's really important to know that the Department of State is the only government, is the only website where you can apply. So you can't apply on, you know, mydiversityvisalottery.com. That's not a thing. Um, make sure that you're, uh, you know, all of your interactions with the government regarding the visa program, uh, uh, those are transactions that are taking place in the Department of State work site. Um, and, you know, it is, a, it, it is a true lottery. It's a random lottery. There's no way to increase your winning chances one way or the right. other. The only way to be selected is to apply through the Department of State website. And, and, and I hope you get lucky. Yeah. So, um, well, Brian, I really appreciate your time today. What, what haven't I asked that it's important for uh, our audience to be aware of, especially when it comes to immigration laws? Sure, so great question, I um, appreciate it. The, the main thing I'd wanna convey is that there's this, there's this space where HR compliance and technology, there's, there's more and more of an overlap. Um, and that's really where the company I work for is focusing and interested. And in particular, we can think about um, remote hiring, remote workforces, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, and, and the COVID pandemic is a perfect example of how employment practices, onboarding practices are, are changing in light of more remote working employees. Um, so as, uh, and this was, uh, you know, remote workforces, the trends for in, an increase in remote workforces was happening pre-COVID. COVID has just added gasoline to the fire, right, if you will, right. in terms of how, you know, what percentage of employees are working remotely. So the remoteness of an employee introduces um, some great benefits 
And it also introduces some new risks that employers might not be thinking about, particularly around that I-9 compliance, E-Verify compliance, and, and other immigration compliance uh, factors to consider. The main one is when you complete the Form I-9, um, that form that we talked about at the start of the show, where the employer is verifying the individual's identity and employment authorization, there is a requirement that you meet face-to-face -face with the employee to inspect their employment authorization and identity documents mm -hmm. um, in the presence of the employee. Well, that physical presence is actually, that rule has been suspended in light of COVID. Um, so right now you can inspect documents remotely, meaning via Zoom or via email, although we don't recommend sending pictures of <laughs> documents via email, not very secure. Uh, but at some point this year, it is highly likely that the government will rescind those policies. So if your audience members are familiar with I-9 and are taking advantage of that remote document inspection policy, be aware that that policy will likely end um, and will go back to the requirement of that physical face-to-face -face inspection. And, you know, that'll be dependent upon, um, you know, the... the the course of the pandemic and how things unfold and as we reopen and get back to normal, what, whatever right. that new normal will look like. Just something very important for employers to think about. Great. I appreciate that. Um, so one last thing, Brian, how can folks connect with you? What's the best way uh, to hook up? Sure. Well, you can uh, please go to, uh, you know, metrotech.com. Um, you'll find a whole bunch of information about, uh, about our organization and particularly about the product offerings that I mentioned around immigration compliance and I-9. So you can find out a wealth of information there and you'll be able to get in touch with us. Great, thank you. Thank you again. And it's really been nice to have an opportunity to speak to you today. Great speaking with you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.